What's up, gangsters? It's been a minute. <laughs> it's been a lot of minutes. It is uh, the 10th of December, I think. It is a very cold Sunday morning, and haven't been doing a lot of these video things in 2023, but I've got a bunch of stuff stacked up here, and so uh, how about a whole bunch of minutes of random? <laughs> and yeah, I do mean a bunch, and I'm not even sorry. I'm gonna just take my time and go through all this stuff because I think it's cool, and maybe you will too. And hey, look, you can just think of it as a Christmas bonus that makes up for all of those minutes of random that I haven't delivered this year. So, let's get started, all right? So the first thing is this box right here that came via the United States Postal Service from my good buddy and podcast mate, over at the Sprue Cutters Union, Mr. Tracy Hancock. Now, I'm pretty sure I know one thing that's in here because um, I don't know if I've talked about this anywhere on the channel, but the Arma Hobby Mustang that I built and hated um, that I took to the IPMS USA Nationals in August that I built for the Musaru Cup um, and that got thoroughly snubbed at both events. <laughs> I decided to ship over to uh, uh, Scale Model Challenge, which was partly because uh, Tracy and Chris, my podcast mates, talked me into sending something over because I couldn't attend and it was pretty small, you know, it was just on like a little six by six cube of a base, 170 second scale Mustang, itty bitty thing. Um, and I felt like I could package it effectively. And hey look, scale model challenge is probably, in, I mean, at least in my opinion, I don't think I'm the only one that feels this way, the most legitimate model show and contest on the planet. And I thought, hey, you know what? If I can easily ship this thing over, Tracy and Chris are both going to be there. They can manhandle the model for me. And I can see, you know, if it's actually good enough to uh, get a medal uh, or even, you know, a, a thanks for coming <laughs> at Scale Model Challenge. And so I did. I shipped it over there. That was a whole story. I talked about it on the podcast. I bought a a cheap $12 Craftsman plastic toolbox and some soft foam and I made a little packing case and worked pretty good. Uh, it arrived essentially intact even though I ended up having to use the same said USPS to ship it overseas because FedEx wanted like $300. Um, so anyway, and as it turned out, um, got a medal, got a gold medal. And so uh, Tom Annis, uh, that's who I shipped it to, because he was going to the show. He shipped it back to me, and um, once I knew that the metal was not in the box, I didn't even open it, because I had already decided that that thing was going to go on to a new home. My friend uh, Barry, Barry Biediger, uh, who is one of the hosts of the Small Subjects podcast, made the mistake <laughs> when uh, we were we were talking about it at some point earlier this year and I allowed us how I hated the damn thing and he said well I'd love to have it and, he, and I I never said anything more but I never forgot that and so I just turned that thing right back over to the uh, US Postal Service and shipped it to him in Utah and he's got it and uh, he seems happy about it. So I'm happy that it's got a new home. Anyway, the point is that Mr. Hancock came home from the Netherlands with my gold medal. And he mailed it to me. And it is, I believe, in this box. But this box... I mean, there's something else in here besides that. Because that medal's like, I don't know, two inches in diameter or something. Uh, so... This is going to be like uh, Christmas. So, uh, without further lip flapping on my part and poking myself in the eye with my glasses, let's see what sort of shenanigans 
Mr. Hancock has perpetrated on me here. I mean, for all I know, this could be like a giant pink dildo or something, or who knows. So we'll see. This stuff right here, great for starting fires. And much better than the packing. Oh, look at this. Oh, there's a book in here. I thought this felt kind of book weight. And it looks to be the only thing. Let's just make sure. Yep. Plenty of good fire starting material in there. Now, let's see. Oops, that one didn't really go the way I saw it in my head. Okay, let's see what this book is. Tracy's one of my favorite people. He's a smart guy. If he thinks that there's a book I should look at, then I'm definitely interested. Let's see what this is. The, the American Netherlander, 25 years of expat tales. <laughs> this might be pretty good. I don't know who Greg Shapiro is, but I lived in Antwerp for about six months once upon a time in a previous life, which is just down the road about an hour from uh, Amsterdam. And so, yeah, I have a little bit of experience at being uh, an uh, expat. Here's a chapter. Chapter 8. Dutch sex life. This should be interesting. Dutch culture treats sex as a natural part of life, which is healthy, really. Question 1. How can you best describe Dutch attitudes toward the red light district? A, we don't go there. B, other countries have them too. What's so special about ours? C, we're proud of our adult-themed amusement park. <laughs> yeah, it is A and B. I, I mean, yeah, I, I went there because, because tourism. Why not? I did not participate. I will say that. Uh, but I, uh, you know, for me, it was a challenge as a photographer because photography in the red light district is strictly verboten or however they say, don't fucking do it in Dutch. So, anyhow, there's that. Okay, so that's the book, and that is a super cool gift. I love it. Thank you, Tracy. That's a lovely little Christmas gift. And let's see what else is in the Ziploc bag, all right? A couple of Prismacolor silver pencils for chipping, if you do that. Those are pretty good. And, okay, here is the... Uh, much anticipated metal uh, from SMC. Let's have a look at this. These guys, everything that SMC, uh, Robert Crombecker and his whole staff, everything they do is first class. And this is really no exception. So I'm not going to spend any time taking it out of the box, but there it is. My gold medal from Scale Model Challenge. And I am, look, I am legitimately proud of it. I, it's hard to take IPMS contests seriously because um, honestly, I mean, even people who have been doing them forever will tell you that judging often is kind of a toss up. But at SMC, whole different deal. The judges are basically a team of all stars. They are people who are recognized uh, around the world for being world-class model makers, and uh, they don't mess around. So, you know, if you get any sort of a nod at SMC, you can be proud of it. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. All right, now, as you can see, I have got a whole bunch of stuff here <laughs> on my workbench. And, uh, yeah, let's talk about all of it. So... I mentioned Tom Annies, um, and if you don't know who he is, yeah, you got to get out from under a rock, okay? He makes all of this cool stuff from, you guessed it, Annies. <laughs> and Tom is just, he's just a, 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 a remarkable guy. Not only is he a fantastic scale modeler, but he's really good at uh, marketing and graphic design and everything he does is just top notch. And what this little bit of, of fun is, um, these are, uh, well, these are just some of his products that he makes. 
that you can find over there at annies.io. And he, by the way, has ramped up. He's been doing really well. He's moved into a new actual office that's super cool with a whole uh, farm of 3D printers. I mean, he's not just a, a great model maker and a great photographer and a graphic designer. He's good. He's a good uh, designer of digital models. Um, he's a whiz at Fusion 360 and Blender, and he's a great 3D printer. I mean, the guy's just, a, he's, he's living it. He's living his, his best life. He's got a fucking DeLorean, for fuck's sake. <laughs> he's just an all-around badass, uh, and he makes a lot of really cool stuff. And he sent me some uh, samples. But what this specifically is, okay... This is upgrades for upgrades. I can't ever not think of idiocracy when I say that. If you've seen it, you know you, you know what I'm saying. Anyway, this is a little kit for upgrading the canopy frame on the Tamiya 132nd scale Corsair. It's got, you know, that whole thing has, has got a bunch of stuff on it. It's got mirrors. It's got levers for opening and closing the canopy. There's like a cable in there. You gotta add the cable yourself. But these 3D printed parts are just fantastic. This is Tom's usual level of attention to detail and good design. And uh, these are just really cool. So here, I'm gonna see, let me see if I can open one of these real quickly. And uh, we'll see what the actual print looks like. This is what, uh, I think he's using an 8K printer at this point. Um, but that's the level of detail and fidelity. I mean, and this is not insignificant to design. This little kit, this is just one of the parts. This little kit I think amounts to about 20 pieces by the time it's said and done. And it'll really add a, a very high level of realism to your to your 132nd scale Corsair. Um, really, really cool. And uh, as you can see, he even gives you some instructions so you can see all of the little pieces and how it goes together. Just, you know, as usual, there's not much that he hasn't thought of. Okay, wanted to make some room, get all that stuff out of the way so I could show you this. This is a super cool, very innovative little tool from the geniuses at Masterpiece Models. Now, those are the same guys that sell the, uh, you guys have seen this, on occasion, um, I get a lot of questions about these. This is the uh, jig fixture, the Benchmate. This is a prototype sample with the clamps on it that are there for grabbing things like armor or car bodies as opposed to aircraft. Anyway, they make lots of really nifty tools. And um, this was owned by my good friend, John Geigel. But he decided to sell the company and live the life of a retired gentleman. Nonetheless, he still gets involved because he's just a guy who's got ideas. And this is the Dome Star. This is a little thing that's made so that you can emboss dome shapes into like soft brass photo etch or like a sheet of aluminum, uh, like beer can aluminum or something, anytime you need to make a little dome. And that, I, th I mean, it's a, it's a really cool idea. You can see you use a piece of sponge. It'll also help you if you just need to bend a strip. Um, it, this is a great little idea and I'm actually looking forward to using this thing. So that's pretty cool. Now, speaking of wizards who do cool stuff, a few weeks ago, actually it's been, yeah, maybe about a month ago, I was fortunate enough to have the one and only James Rice come to visit me here at the studio uh, at El Rancho Patterson. And we just spent a couple of days geeking out on digital modeling, talking about ZBrush and Fusion 360, 
And in addition to spending a few hours giving me some great figure painting advice, because if you've don't ever, if you've never seen his work, Jim is just, I mean, he's an alien. He's, he's just one of those multi-talented guys who not only is an amazing figure painter, but he's also a fantastic sculptor using all of the traditional hand methods, but he's also taken to uh, uh, digital sculpting in ZBrush like a fish to water. I mean, it's really amazing what he's done. And his company is called Sabo Miniatures. They're located in Louisiana, and they have all kinds of cool stuff for sale. You gotta get over there to their website and check it out. But one of the things he's doing, Jim is, he, he does a lot of workshops. Um, I was able to organize a workshop in Austin in conjunction with the good folks, Danielle and Rudy at Lionheart Hobbies in April that Jim came and taught. Two day workshop, if you ever get a chance to go to one of them, they're fantastic. And he's a really good teacher. He's getting ready to start a Patreon. He's going to do a YouTube channel. And one of the things that he believes in is practice, practice, practice. And so he's got this line of academic heads that he's created, which are basically just generic, a generic head. And they come in a bunch of different scales. He left me a whole selection of them going down to 148th, I believe, maybe 135th is the smallest. I don't know, there's not a 148th one in here, but anyway, you can see, uh, these are brilliant. They have lots of great detail, so they're fun and easy to paint and practice on. And um, he 3D prints and casts these and sells them in different scales. And if you need to just, you know, if you wanna just practice, and not worry about stripping the paint off after you do each one, or if you want to just do one and throw it in a you know vat of alcohol or whatever, if you're using acrylics, then you can do that. And it's just great to be able to just practice over and over again. Because one thing that I am convinced of, aside from the fact that I'm never going to be a world-class figure painter, is that part of becoming one is lots and lots of practice. So yeah, he left me these. Uh, I don't, <laughs> probably never gonna use them cause I just, I'm too fucking lazy. And even though I wanna be a figure painter when I grow up, I just don't have the discipline or the energy to do the real work that it takes. But look at that. I mean, that's pretty cool. And he's also making these. These are uh, generic eye practice sculpts. So you can just sit there and paint eyeballs all day long and at different scales, which I, look, I mean, I think that's the one thing aside from getting good flesh tones and blending that terrifies most scale modelers about figure painting, right? Is painting those fucking eyeballs. So there you go. Now you got no more excuses. You can practice all day long. Okay. Now, what's next? Okay, so yeah, you can see, yeah, this is sort of a sad tale. This is Frankenbrush in a very sad condition right now because, yeah, Ninja, my newest and youngest cat, who is an absolute terrorist, decided to yank it out of my spray booth and throw it on the floor and it was really kind of bizarre because it broke, it hit in such a way that it broke the quick connect off at the base right there. <laughs> that was pretty, pretty, pretty wild. I mean, it only fell like three, three or four feet. And I thought, well, okay, no big deal. But as soon as I tried to use it, I realized that it was a bigger deal because it was just not spraying correctly. It was doing something funny. And I got to looking at it a little closer and I realized that the needle, it had obviously landed on the back of the needle. I don't ever put the back of the airbrush on, you know, the cover for the, for the needle at the back because it's honestly just a waste of time to take that off and then pull the needle out. So I just leave them open all the time. Well, the penalty for that is, yeah, that if it falls, it can hit the, the tail end of the needle and that's what happened here. And you can see, if you look, 
you can see that one is bent a little bit back there. And so because of the way it was spraying, like I would just barely pull the trigger and instead of a nice controlled spot, it was puking, spitting out globs of, of paint, which that's obviously not acceptable. And I thought, well, it's hit the, ne the back of the needle and jammed it into the nozzle hard enough to crack the nozzle and I'm gonna have to get new parts and, and replace the, the needle in the nozzle. So I did that, feeling very confident that it was going to solve the problem. Well, here is said brand new needle. And yeah, not only did it not solve the problem, but it started acting even crazier. You can see that it was getting paint clear back here on the back end of said brand new needle. So honestly, I don't know what the heck to think. I don't know what is going on. Something is very bad wrong in there though. That, that much is certain. And so the only thing I know to do, at least to start with, is to take the whole thing apart, inspect it, uh, with magnifier and see if I can figure out what's going on. I mean, I, you know, I hate it. Worst case is I'll have to buy a whole nother body. Uh, if you don't remember what this thing is about, I did a video um, where I talked about it, but this is the uh, Procon Boy PS275, which I wanted for its trigger because that's what works for me with my stupid lobster hands. But even though it says 0.3 here, it is not. I wanted to build a 0.2 millimeter needle trigger airbrush. And as it turns out that you can do that by using the nozzle from the PS267, the air cap as well, I think this is from the PS267, and the needle is from an Iwata HPB. So you combine all those parts and you can in fact have a 0.2 millimeter trigger airbrush and it works beautifully. It's like my favorite thing. I look for excuses to use the thing because it's just so much fun. You can spray just such tiny, tiny little spots of paint. So I gotta get this thing fixed. It really is stressing me out that something is so wrong with it. But it's been sitting here on the bench doing nothing for the last, yeah, several weeks as has been this poor thing. <laughs> yes, the Tiny Sherman of the Tiny Sherman Adventure. Yeah, it's been sitting here untouched for about a month because, yeah, I got to the point where I did uh, a base color of dust and dirt on uh, the lower half of the hull and the tracks, and um, that's all going fine. Um, but uh, yeah, this poor thing, poor, sad, <laughs> forgotten stepchild. This thing has been on my bench, off and on my bench, one way or the other for about a year now. And um, I am gonna finish it before the end of this year. But yeah, I don't know why, I just can't love the thing the way that I've loved other things. And it's really silly because this whole year has been about doing projects like I did the stupid, uh, you know, Arma Hobby uh, 148th scale PZL. Not that that is a stupid kit, it's a great little kit. It's just that for me, it was just an exercise. I didn't love it, it was just like, you know, doing something that was out of my comfort zone. And somehow, the little Sherman has gotten the back seat even to that sort of thing. So, I feel bad for it. Uh, yeah, I can't even explain it. I'm pretty stoked about this, actually. I actually love the little Sherman more than the other stuff, but I just, for whatever reason, I keep getting stalled. Now, what has kept me from paying attention to it and the airbrush for the last month? Well, yeah, it's this, which I definitely do love. This is the culmination of about 200 hours of CAD design work, research time, and just general, you know, gnashing of my teeth, pulling out of what little hair I have, and grinding away at the project. 
This is the hashtag, the real tiger, which it's called that because this is uh, a project I've been working on by the calendar for about three years now. Um, and it is going to be, when it's done, a 3D printed kit of the Steiger Tiger Turbo 2. This is a 1977 model. They built this tractor only for a couple of years. This thing is iconic American farm iron. And I got the idea, well, I started down this path because um, there's not really any good kits of any iconic American farm tractors. The closest you're going to come is the Heller Massey TE20, and that's only because it was the precursor to the Ford 8 and 9N. And the Ford 9N is the single most successful farm tractor ever produced, and still only like half a million units over its entire lifetime. Anyway, I'm, I'm wandering as I do. Anyway, big articulated four-wheel drive tractors are sort of the pinnacle of big agriculture mechanical stuff. And this thing was kind of the thing that really like was the was the front runner in that technology and and I love it plus it actually was built in Europe in Hungary under a different brand and I picked up a resin kit from I don't even remember the name of the company um but it's called the Raba Steiger and when I got it I was like holy shit this thing is horrible and originally I was only going to do the tires because they were terrible well, as you can see, that has turned into far more. And the reason that this is a milestone is because one thing that I want to do, like I'm, I, I decided, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to make this like a kit that anybody can build, not just me. And so I've been trying to design it intelligently um, to not only meet that requirement, but to be easily 3D printable, but also to have really good detail. And one of the things, okay, these tractors, the way they steer, it's not by just turning the front wheels. It's by bending in the middle. It's why it's called an articulated four-wheel drive tractor. Each axle is rigid and the thing literally pivots right here in the middle to, to make a turn. And so I wanted this thing not to be functional like a toy, but to be poseable. You know, if you wanted to pose the model in the middle of a turn, you could do that. And so that meant basically figuring out the engineering of this entire system from photographs and from the real one that's just up the road for me that I go look at every so often. And there's a lot of tolerances. It's just, you know, it's just not, it's just been a, a, it's been a, it's been a challenge and it's been fun, but I'm here to tell you that it's, it's been done. Yep. That was the sound of something breaking, hopefully not badly, but at any rate, it does pivot and it can be posed. And I am really pretty proud of it that you can see that what, how it, how the thing operates is it's got these cylinders right here. These are hydraulic cylinders that push on this pivot yoke or pull, push and pull, I guess. And that's what turns the thing. Now, part of what complicates that though, and I'm going to have to flip it over for you to be able to see this. In the process, you'll also be able to see the, that it has to also have a hip joint. Because if this thing is going over uneven ground, the front and the back half of the tractor have to be able to rock independently. And so it also pivots in that direction. And you'll be able to see that a little bit better when I flip it over. Now, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I can do this on camera without breaking something. Hopefully I've built it well enough that it's not gonna just fall apart. But this will let you see a little bit better what the challenges are. So the thing pivots here, and this is the drawbar that you can attach implements to, and it has to pivot at that same point. But you have drive lines that go from the transfer case to the front 
and rear axles and also obviously come out of the back of the of the of the motor and the that thing the transfer case which you can kind of see if i turn it let's see if i can turn it you can see it in there the transfer case obviously is not going to allow the drive shafts to pivot at the same center that the tractor pivots at so you have to depend on the u-joints at the front and back of each drive line as well as the sliding section of the drive shaft to be able to change the length right here so that everything will move without binding and figuring all that out was that was the real engineering challenge and i'm pretty proud of the fact that i was able to pull that off because and make it where you can assemble the thing so you can see if you look close you'll see this drive line is sliding because it's made up of actually four pieces there is a front there's a drive shaft base right here and then there's this piece the front part of the drive line then there's the back part of the drive line and then there's another drive shaft base on the transfer case and if you look you'll be you should be able to see the length of the drive shaft changing as it pivots hopefully and it does it at the back as well but you can't see it because it's inside this pivot yoke anyway it all works it doesn't bind that little snap that you heard i think was just something catching on the bottom of the transfer case but part of how it works is let me uh, i gotta slide back over to the other side of my bench and grab something so the way this works is with through the beauty of a snap fit so this is the drive shaft base that's put into one of the axles and I knew that there was an angle that the drive line had to maintain vertically. You can see, obviously, that when you look at this from the side, in order to reach down from the transfer case to the front axle, you've got a vertical displacement there. Same thing on the back. That's pretty, pretty, pretty obvious. So what I did is I made that angle, I figured out what that angle was, and made that fixed. And then I made the angle in the other axis into a little snap fit hinge. So basically what you've got there is the top and the bottom of the drive shaft bit of the universal joint that's on the drive shaft base is a cup. And there's a little rounded nub on the top and the bottom of the mating part of this part of the drive line and you kind of swivel it and snap it in there and depend on that drive shaft base flexing and then when it snaps in there then this will swivel back and forth oops and fall apart if you're not careful not as not as big of a deal once it's in there but you can kind of see the challenge is to get a, a a snap fit that will function without being too difficult to assemble and yet will stay together good enough that you can actually you know count on it stay and put while you you know assemble the rest of the model and uh yeah so i'm pretty i'm honestly pretty stoked about this the fact that this that this is kind of working and so what you basically have to do is like for this rear drive line is i glue the front part into the transfer case and, and, well, I assemble all of the little snap fit U-joints in each half of each drive line, and then insert all of the ones that go into the transfer case and glue them in place. Then slip the front 
or the other part of the drive line over that slide joint and add the axle and then grab the drive line with tweezers and slide the drive shaft base into the axle. And then you can add glue at that point if you need to. And it honestly, it works pretty good. I'm pretty stoked. So anyway, yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a whole lot of me nerding out on this particular project. I am stoked to be at this point. Um, I wish I could show you some of the pieces of the resin kit that started all this, but I've already put it away. I'm not going to get it back out. Uh, but it, this is, you know, in terms of detail, is a lot better. The, uh, the, the resin kit does not give you any uh, flexibility at the joint. And yeah, it did in fact break. You can see the, uh, yep, that's where it fractured right there. And that's okay, because what this thing is, this is... This is all just engineering fit and testing. And a lot of these parts have been printed multiple times and refined and reprinted to figure out what's going on. So if that's, you know, got a little problem there, not a big deal. This is basically a sacrificial lamb at this point. Um, but uh, at any rate, that's, that's where the project is at. Um, and... I am thrilled to just give you a little bit of a view. This is the three-point hitch. It's not functional, but it also has snap fits between some of the components because getting all of that put together is a little bit of a puzzle as well. But hopefully this thing will all turn out okay in the end. As you can see, it has no engine yet. That's the next challenge to find some good references for the Cummins 903 and build a good CAD model of that that uh, will be fun to put together and have lots of detail. And then I got to do the cab and the interior. So I feel like at this point I'm maybe 60% done. So anyway, and at this, oh wait, no, I was about to say that and at this point I'm done with the video, but I almost forgot. I got some other cool stuff to show you guys. Hang on. Yep, got some books over here. Now, I get uh, a very cool complimentary subscription to Scale Aviation. This is a Japanese magazine. I think I've showed it to you guys before. It's, it's fun because it's from Japan and I can't read any of it, but it's fun to look through it. And as you can see, it's backwards. They, they, they hinge their, their books on the opposite side. It's full of beautiful artwork, uh, full of, <laughs> it's got a pinup, um, which is always kind of amusing and fun. Um, you know, hey, it's Japan. What are you going to do? All right. I don't make the rules. Anyway, this is the feature in this particular issue. And this is built by Chris Sieber. And if you don't know his work, you got to check him out on the, the old farce books. Um, his uh, web page or his Facebook page, I'm pretty sure, is um, Luftraum72. I think that's right. And he is a master. He is just a really, really good model maker and a brilliant painter. And it's kind of funny because I think what he does is absolutely by, the, by you know, I think any objective definition of what art is, absolutely this qualifies. He denies it. He doesn't want to accept that. Yeah, well, whatever. We can agree to disagree. But the point is that it's featured here in the magazine because these guys that publish the magazine also do books and they've produced an entire book dedicated to this model and um, to going through Chris's method step by step. And I was fortunate enough to kind of get an advanced copy. It is available now and it's it's just a really fantastic book. If you like how-to books, if you're an aircraft modeler, if you want to raise your paint game to the next level, 
this thing, I mean, he's Chris is a master of, I think you could kind of say that his signature style uh, involves getting a lot of tonal variety. Um, and you can see, like, just looking at, like, this picture, you can see what I'm talking about. Like, who knows? I mean, if, you know, everybody wants to make the Fifty Shades of Grey joke. Well, he's got probably a lot more than 50 on there. He is a master of that sort of patina. In fact, I'm going to be studying this book before I do my next aircraft project because I think I do okay at this, but there's always something to learn from somebody who's truly mastered a technique, and Chris definitely has. So uh, this, look, great book, definitely worth going out there and finding it. Now, speaking of books, huh, this is pretty cool. Uh, I am just fortunate to have some really good friends in the scale modeling community. My buddy Jake McKee from down in Austin found this. Uh, he was uh, someplace in his travels and he just happened to see this and he picked it up. And this is just a, a super cool book with a bunch of really beautiful reference photos in it. And I love Spitfires. I've built way more of them than is reasonable and probably will end up building at least one more because I've got the Kotari um, Mark I uh, just sitting in a box, just waiting for some attention. I don't know when I'll get to it, but this is just a really, really cool book full of great reference photos. Um, and this one actually is in English. So yeah, so Jake, you're just a good human being and this is much appreciated. Thank you so much for this. So anyway, with that, finally, all of these minutes of random are at an end. <laughs>